you have been cordially invited to celebrate the completion of the first year of ministry of a live church. With guest speaker, Apostle Ivy Hilliard. Join us as we celebrate all that God has done, and as we look to the future, for greater. To God be the glory. What's up, ladies? What's up, ladies? What's up, ladies? I'm excited to gather with you on this evening for our book club. Tonight, we have a special treat. I called for all the boss babes to get on tonight, all the entrepreneurs, all the inspiring entrepreneurs, all of the women who want to excel and elevate in their career and just your life, because let's just be honest, we are leaders in more than just our careers and our businesses. We're leaders in our home, in our community. And so tonight the conversation is going to be so good, so, so good. And I'm super excited that you all have decided to join us on tonight. And we're going to be discussing um, the book Servant Leadership in Action by Ken Blanchard. And so uh, we picked uh, the women chapters in there that pertain to, that were written by women and kind of pertain to us. And so I'm super excited to go through some questions. And I have a very, very special guest with me tonight, Miss Rochelle Parker. For those of you who don't know, you're like, what qualifies Miss Rochelle to to be able to, to give us advice about leadership and entrepreneurship? Well, let me just do her a little rundown very quickly. Uh, Rochelle is a graduate. Uh, well, first, she is a believer. She's a believer. Um, she is a great wife and mom. And so she uh, graduated from Fisk University and then she got her MBA at Rockhurst University. And so she has been a nonprofit leader in the nonprofit sector for, I believe, over 20 years. And so currently she is the CEO of the Kappa organization, which helps children in need. And so she's a CEO of Boss Babe. Not only that, but she is in real estate. She's a real estate investor. She has her own business. And so they do a whole lot of stuff, her and her husband. But, you know, one of the things I love about Rochelle is that she, um, what, what, motivates me about her and what makes me really proud to call her my friend and my mentor is just the way that she lives her life out of all her accolades out of all the things that she does and we could go on and on and on i'm sure but what really stands out for me is just how she lives her life how she's just a leader in her home how she's a great mom, how she's a great wife, how she's, you know, in the community. She's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And she also is a part of many different civic organizations here in the Kansas City era, area. I know that she does a lot for her alumni at Fisk University. So ladies, let's welcome Rochelle Parker. Thank in you. the house. Thank you so much. That was a that was a lot. That was a little overwhelming. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> you so you've done a lot, and I think I just like scratched the surface. So oh. that was that was awesome. Well, yes. Thank you. thank you for having me tonight. No <laughs> problem. No problem. So you know, Rochelle, do you want to add anything? I think I gave a. Uh, you said a lot, but do you want to add anything about yourself or anything for the people to know? Well, you know, what? what's so fun for me about this topic is that this is what I'm studying now. So I'm working on my uh, doctorate. At mm -hmm. Liberty University, so my doctorate in business administration with an emphasis in leadership, and so yes. uh, servant leadership was one of the classes that I took uh, last semester. And so the book that we're talking about tonight was was a book that was part of my homework assignments right. for a couple Perfect. of months. So I'm Perfect. excited to talk about the takeaways from the book. Yes, I'm super excited as well. So we're going to just dive right in. Make sure that you put your questions and comments in the chat, and we'll be able to see them. And any questions that you have for Rochelle or any Anything that you, you know, she hits home, any nuggets that you want to type in, maybe somebody will come back later and read them. Or if they didn't catch it, put it in the chat, you know, they'll be able to read it later. So make sure you interact with us. And we're going to be watching, both of us are going to be watching the chat to see if you have any questions. So let's dive right in. Rosha, what is servant leadership? And I want you to answer this in regards to kind of what the book is saying and then what it means to you personally, servant leadership. You know, there's so many 
uh, definitions for servant leadership. And I think mm -hmm. I've narrowed it down to probably a couple words. And it's just a leader that serves others. You wow. Know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, you know, a lot of times when we think about leadership and we think about achieving a certain level of leadership, mm -hmm. we think about delegating tasks and what can I ask people to do for me? And mm -hmm. I've made it so maybe I can just kind of sit back and chill and do and do nothing or do little. And servant leadership really puts you um, in a position where you're serving alongside of the people that mm -hmm. in an organizational chart may be, you know, beneath you on, on, on somebody's chart, but you're rolling up your sleeves right? Um, and you're getting your hands dirty just like everybody else. And so I really love the concept. Mm -hmm. You know, I found um, not in this book, but in some other studying that I did that uh, sometimes people of color have a issue with the word servant leadership because they're you know, like, I don't want to be anybody's servant. And, I'm yeah, wow. and it's not talking about that. It's not talking mm -hmm. about being enslaved. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not talking about slavery, but it's talking about being a servant, just like we are with Christ. You yes. Know, we serve Christ. So um, I love the definition, but that's me narrowing it down. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Serves alongside. Right. And that's good. And I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of times, you know, when people hear, uh, think about leadership, they're like, I'm at a point where I can just sit back and just give orders. Like a lot of people feel like, you know, that's just, and that's kind of sometimes how the world, you know, looks at it as just like, I'm the manager and you're just going to do what I tell you to do. And a lot of the times, you know, it's, um, I'm not going to lead by example. I'm just going to ask you to do it. And then I'm going to do, you know, like some people tell their kids, don't do what I don't do what I do, do what I say <laughs> type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And so uh, that that's awesome. So how does our faith affect how we lead? And what is the difference between maybe someone if you've had any experiences where you've had someone who wasn't a servant leader that you worked under or, you know, had one that was what was the difference? And how does our faith kind of contribute to that, those things? Oh my man, that kind of triggered some <laughs> past work trauma that I had. Right. You know, where um, you know, I have worked for individuals that were mm -hmm. not servant leaders. They were the traditional secular leader. And mm -hmm. there's a lot about uh, secular leadership that's that's right, um, but then there's a lot of it that is very carnal and it's not right. Christ centered. Yeah. And so, you know, people can get caught up into ego mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to just you know, not being empathetic and sympathetic towards others. And I've experienced that in the workplace. I've experienced right. where even in the nonprofit uh, field, where it's about numbers, mm -hmm. how many people did we bring in the door? How many meals True. did we serve? Yes. You know, and there's no heart in it, um, even in organizations where there's supposed to be heart and mission. Mm -hmm. And what I found is those organizations where the leader is not empathetic, um, is is a, is that secular leader? Is mm -hmm. usually there's high turnover there. You know, people yes. over time, especially this generation and the generation, you know, younger younger uh, the generation mm -hmm. younger than us, they're not putting up for that. You know, people not being sensitive. And so, um, I have worked for a servant leader in in progress, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and she tried, but the culture of the organization just didn't allow mm -hmm. her to really lead in a Christ center. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting dynamic, right? So, um, now that I lead an organization, I can lead it in the way that, you know, um, that I that truly fits my my personality and my, and my characteristics and my values. Yes. And that is amazing. You know, yes, um, I think sometimes people think servant leadership is you proselytizing people and saying, you know, you need to believe in Jesus. <laughs> and it's really a lifestyle. Right. You know, it's really. Oh, us. that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's us leading like Christ yes. in the workplace. Wow. Um, so, you know, when you mm -hmm. mention faith, I think of a couple of things, you know, we, we use that word interchangeably. Right. Some people will say, well, my faith is Christianity. Right. And that comes values and integrity and morals and a Christ-like mm -hmm. behavior. But then there's faith, um, like in terms of like faith principles and us right. believing that uh, God has done everything that he's going to do and he's going to do everything he's going to say. And we believe mm -hmm. that we stand on it. And that meant, uh, you know, implementing faith principles in the workplace as a believer right. is, is like amazing. We may have to have a whole nother conversation about yes, that. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, that is totally a whole nother uh a whole nother book club, but yes, yes. that's awesome. <laughs> One of the things you said that I was triggered by was the generation, uh, the difference in generation. So I think I was watching something and maybe it was today, but they were saying how we need to, uh, you know, uh, middle age and like the baby boomers are retiring and how we need to really embrace that this generation is not looking to be at a nine to five, sitting at a desk all day and just doing that for 40 years. And they're not interested in, you know, corporate schmoozing or climbing the corporate ladder. They're more interested in 
how is this position going to fit to my lifestyle? Am I still going to be able to, you know, go do my yoga class in the afternoon, you know, do whatever and travel. And, exactly. and so I think that's huge too, as you are becoming a leader, especially even if you're an entrepreneur or you're, you know, opening a business and you're hiring, you know, younger people just mm -hmm. to have that mentality as well. Like that old school managerial style does not go over with them at all. And I find too that, you know, even outside of business, it doesn't work well in any setting, even the church, you know, it's like you, you have to kind of meet them kind of where they are and just kind of like accept that times have changed. So uh, being in your organization or, you know, just being your in leadership period, I know you're, you're in several different um, organizations in the community and, you know, your church, active in your church, how has servant leadership helped you with dealing with that generation? If wow. at all. You know, what's so um, one of my favorite words is probably cool. So I'm gonna say cool. Like, what's no, so cool right. <laughs> is that we're like in that hybrid generation, right? Yes. So our parents um, got a job in their 20s mm -hmm. and stayed there till they retired, had a great pension and lived a right. great life, barely took vacation. Yep. You know, felt guilty when they took it. And um, those, you know, that our parents' generation is still in the workplace. Mm -hmm. and then you have our children and even, you know, well, our children's generation, who is exactly who you described, Erica, where yes. they value uh, flexibility and mm -hmm. traveling and living a life. Yes. <laughs> That's not Absolutely. so surrounded around work. And we're sandwiched in the middle. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, culti cultivating an environment that respects both of those is right. so important until we've kind of, you know, been <laughs> to yes. kind of get along on this. You know, you're, you know, I have in my workplace now, um, you know, my parents' generation and mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they are still doing pen to paper. <laughs> They're still, you know, having, you know, uh, challenges with, uh, you know, uh, getting acclimated to computer things and mm -hmm. we're patient with them because there's a lot there right. they have that some other generations don't have in terms yes. of loyalty. That's and true. Loyalty is yes. huge when you're running a business because mm -hmm. it's expensive to replace people. But Absolutely. Then I love the younger generation because they're like, hey, I'll see you in a month. I saved up all my vacation. Right. I'm going out of the country. <laughs> right. or not, and I'll, you know, I'll see you when I get back. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. come back and they're, you know, they they feel good about themselves. Yes. So um, well, I think one of the things that is unique about servant leadership is it straddles all three of those generations. So when the Very true. is introduced, Mm -hmm. those generations, and so that's like a leadership style that you can take in any of the generations. That's good. Yeah, it, it helps you just respect people. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps you see people. You know, listen yes. to them and meet them right where they are instead of you know trying to make your leadership style cookie cutter. Right. Very true. Very true. And like you said, we're in that hybrid generation. Like I think about my dad, who the very first job that he got was for General Motors and he worked there 40 years and retired. And I'm like, you had a, the same job for 40 years. Like the most my like for me is like maybe six years, maybe yeah. like four, yeah. you know, five to six years. Yeah. And that's that's a lot to some people like, um, you know, in their, their generation, things like you just getting started at five years. But, exactly. you know, for millennials, they're like, that's like a lot. That's like a yes. lifetime at a job. And so, yes, yes, yes. And, you know, what COVID did, I don't know if you've seen the articles about the number of uh, people who have relocated and didn't tell their employer. Right, and right. They're like, we're going to come back this fall. And they're like, well, I live in another state. And I right. read an article, I won't say the company's name, but they're going to be people. Right. I want to come back into the office. And so this is something we have to figure out. Like, COVID mm -hmm. just kind of happened. And, yes. Uh, a lot of companies figured it out. Unfortunately, some didn't. But mm -hmm. we still have to figure that thing out. Not yep. just want to come back in the office. And some people don't even Man. live in the city anymore. I'm house. telling you, that's so yeah. funny because I saw a meme that said the lady was on the beach with her laptop and she said she got an email that said, uh, coming back into the office next week. She was like, I don't even live <laughs> in the exactly. same city anymore. And I was like, yeah. wow, that's really happening like everywhere. And, you know, yeah. people are just like, I refuse to go back to office because mm -hmm. I feel like once you've shown people that what they can do from home, like, what's the point of me coming in? Especially okay. that generation. They're like, what's the point of me doing this every day? Exactly. So, that is hilarious. I wanted to talk about the book just a little bit. Some of the um, the uh, chapters that I really like is uh, on page 98, The Servant Leader Identity. And Lori Jones uh, wrote that that book. And then um, Treat People, Treat Your People as Family. Treat Your People as Family. That was on page 183. And so I kind of wanted to, to talk about that a little bit, especially because Treat your people as family. 
for me, I feel like that can go both ways. I feel like you can get way too comfortable with your with your staff or, you know, your your employees. And then you can be totally just disconnected. So it, for me, it has to be something in the middle. Like, I'm not going to totally treat you like my family because, you know, I, I treat my family like, you know, they're my family. Yeah. But and this is business. So what did you think about just that that kind of situation where you want to treat them as family and have them comfortable, but at the same time be professional? You know, I think for every organization, they have to come up with their own family rules, right? So, you know, mm. I don't know if you are family, if you had family meetings, mm -hmm. <laughs> we had family meetings and everybody right. sat down and we had to, you know, talk through some things. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we've done that in our organization. We refer to each That's other good. as family, but uh, we had to agree on what that looked like. Right. Because, you know, it is work. People, yeah. you know, especially if people start having personnel issues and they need to be terminated and, you, right. know, you know, different things like that going on. You don't want it to be like, oh, you're my cousin, my work cousin. Right. My work cousin. <laughs> right. But, but we take those good pieces mm -hmm. of family and we put yeah. them in the workplace. And again, right. that's like the mutual respect. That's right. Communication. That's yeah. caring about people other than just their work. It's caring mm -hmm. about like, how are you doing at home? How are you doing mm -hmm. outside of work without getting in everybody's business and, and mm -hmm. things like that? So I think for organizations, whether it's nonprofits, for-profit churches, they need to this, they need to have the conversation. Hey, what are the ground rules, family? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are mm -hmm. the ground rules? Um, mm -hmm. And realizing there are still labor laws and, and, mm -hmm. and things like that you have to layer with it. But it has to be a conversation. Yeah. And and you can take a thousand organizations and get a thousand different versions right. of what family uh, rules look like. Mm -hmm. And when you said what you said was so good. It just depends on the culture of that organization as well. Just how, you know, and I always believe the leader uh, sets the tone for everybody else. So if you, you know, have that laid back style, then your people are going to be super laid back and, you know, maybe nothing gets done, but you have to kind of be comfortable in that. So yeah. awesome. Exactly. Awesome. Exactly. So let's switch gears just a little bit because okay. I know there are some entrepreneurs um, on here and I know there are some yes. aspiring entrepreneurs on here. Yes. So some people are saying uh, a servant leadership is a leader that serves. Oh, somebody saw the meme I was talking about. <laughs> Funny. Yes, that was that was hilarious. <laughs> right. So let's let's switch gears really quickly. Okay. What are some of the ways? Uh, hold on, I'm sorry, I've lost my notes. Okay, so what do you think are some important characteristics for entrepreneurship? Because some people want to be entrepreneurs and then they get in it and they're like, oh, nobody's telling me that I got to get up and go to work today or do you know do yeah. something today to generate some income. And it sounds great that you can be ahead of your own schedule, uh, um, you know, uh, the boss of your own schedule. But at the same time, I know most entrepreneurs that I know work more than 40 hours a week. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It, it's it's it is. It's hard work. Um, mm -hmm. And not that it's impossible, obviously, because you right. know, one of the greatest examples we have in our time is Amazon. I think we've all mm -hmm. seen the picture of the owner of Amazon sitting in his garage with his handwritten sign. And now he's, Ooh. you know, I don't yes. even know what the, the net worth, his net worth is and the company's oh net worth goodness. is, but it's possible. But it is hard work. It, mm -hmm. it takes integrity. It takes responsibility. Mm -hmm. It takes, you know, you being a risk taker. You right. Know, you're going to have to kind of put yourself out there and, mm -hmm. and actually exercise your faith and, 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 and just trust that things are going to come back the way you need for them to come back. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it is very rewarding, though. It is mm -hmm. very rewarding. And one of the things that one of my girlfriends and I have been talking about is automating your business, you know, because even um, entrepreneurs that put in 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. I bet you if they sat down and really looked at what they were doing, some of the things that they're doing could be automated. Yeah. You know, some of the things could yeah. probably could be done by somebody who's a little bit more efficient. Sometimes mm -hmm. we try to, and you know, when we're entrepreneurs, we try to do it all ourselves. We try True. to do our own taxes. We yes. try to be our own attorney. We try to be our own marketing person. And sometimes right. you have to outsource that stuff. Right. You know, really great um, consultants and even organizations um, in probably every major city that mm -hmm. can help you in those areas that, you know, just that's not your thing. Right. And, and, that's, and that's probably one of the biggest things that I would encourage entrepreneurs to realize is, is what is your what is your groove and what is your thing? You yes. can not do everything. And it is right. Okay. It doesn't mean you're not brilliant. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you don't have a, a great idea or a great business. It means that you need some help. I mean, yes. when you look at big, successful organizations. They have an HR department. They have an mm -hmm. accounting department. 
They have right. a facilities and maintenance department. Like it's not right. one person trying to do it all. So at some point yes. in your business, you have to grow out of being that one man show that works all those hours. So mm -hmm. we've been full-time entrepreneurs before we've been part-time entrepreneurs. We've done a mix of the two. And yeah. for us, it's been very exhilarating, very rewarding, mm -hmm. very profitable. Yes. Um, but we also have layered our entrepreneurship with right, with faith principles. Like we're not out here like unsaved without faith. Right. We're just not here doing it. We're like, okay, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> we believe, you it. believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh and and it's and it's worked well for us. But you know, yeah. I think everybody has like this passion or this mission inside of them. Mm -hmm. And people just have to decide, am I gonna do this on my own and have people pay me for it? Or am right. I gonna you know, partner with an organization or get hired by an organization and do it for them. True. Um, wow. I think another thing that I've just learned over the years, even personally, uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship, is charging people. Like you that's know, good. Yeah. You know, a lot of times in our community, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're supposed to get things for yes. free. Yes. And so then, even as business owners, we feel like we have to give things for free. Mm -hmm. And there's a time that you do that, and it's called you know when you are running a profit. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Trying, maybe when you're trying to sow a seed into somebody. Right. Like, there early on, you know, in our entrepreneurial ventures. I, I probably gave, we probably both gave tens of thousands of dollars worth of our time away wow. trying to help people, trying to coach yes. people. But that comes with a price tag. Wow. So now, now I charge. Yeah. <laughs> you want to have sure. time with me? You're going to buy me lunch or you're going to pay me by the hour. Because yep. Those days of, of me giving away my time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of, you know, it's over for the most part. The yes. Most part. <laughs> and then people throw that in there real slick. Can I just pick your brain for a minute? And that oh. turns into a, a hour phone conversation. I'm like, that's called a uh, consulting fee. It is. It is. <laughs> and it's not a pick your brain. It's literally me giving you my intellectual property. Like you, exactly. you know, so my brain is 15 minutes and we mm -hmm. get to know the phone. Right. <laughs> it's exactly. 15 minutes being layered every week. It's not right. Like, I don't do this every week. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so just, just valuing ourselves and realizing yes. that as a community um, mm -hmm. of color and of African Americans, we 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 got we we're worth it. We're worth yep. it. we're worth uh, the same thing as our our counterparts of other cultures. Mm -hmm. And yes. large. and and one of my friends he told me, or actually he uh he, he didn't tell me he posted this on Facebook. Let me say that mm -hmm. right. He posted on Facebook. If they don't want to pay, they're not your customer. And I had to take Ooh. that on. I was like, somebody oh, needs God. to type that in the chat. They yes. don't want to pay. They're not your customer. No, no. Yes. And so then one day he was on Facebook fussing and I called him. I was like, that's not your customer. Like, leave it alone. You know, like, <laughs> right. And, you know, and I had to hold him accountable to that. But that's true. Mm -hmm. If they don't want to pay, yeah. you're not your customer. Because that your time is so is true. money. You're taking away time from your family. Mm -hmm. You're taking away time from self-care. Yes. You're taking away time from being innovative or whatever you're going to be. You're taking away mm -hmm. time watching Married at First Sight, whatever, you know, whatever. Right. You been exactly. Doing your time. It's, it's, yeah. it's a cost to that. So Yes, absolutely. And time is something that you don't get back. And you're right. Because even when with me, you know, in my business, people will say, oh, that that that's too much. That's too much for the skincare set or whatever. And it's like... Mm -hmm. I would be like, okay, well, I'm going to give you, you know, a discount, da, 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 da. But now I'm like, like you said, like, if, go somewhere else, go to Walmart and buy your skincare. I mean, you know, like whatever works for you, but this is, yep. you know, my business. Yep, exactly. Uh, it's my livelihood. It's yes. Livelihood. <laughs> <laughs> Since we have mostly women on here, um, and I know some men may, may watch the replay, but um, I kind of want to talk about, because I think you do this so awesome. A lot of people, when they... Um, want to start a business or become entrepreneurs, they immediately feel like they have to leave their job. Yeah. And so one of the nuggets that you just said was praying about, you know, is this something that I can do in the marketplace? Maybe it's something where, you know, I get a position to, to work this thing and to develop skills, mm -hmm. and then I'll be able to kind of shift out on my own. And so one of the things I know that you do very well is you have a perfect balance. You've been a full-time entrepreneur, but like now you're the CEO of an organization. And so, but you still do other business ventures and you balance them both. So any advice about if to, for the aspiring entrepreneurs, if they're wanting to start a business, what would it look like for them to continue to work their job or, you know, and, or just totally leave their job? And how do you balance all of that? Wow, that's that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what came to mind was kind of people's investment strategies. Right. Mm -hmm. So like if you're young, you're tw in your 20s, right mm -hmm. out of high school, right out of college. They tell you you can uh, you can invest aggressively because right. you have 
40 years before you need the money. So you right. can, you know, you can afford for the ups and downs. And then yes. when you're in your forties, it's like, well, you might need a mix of aggressive mm -hmm. and not so aggressive. And then when you're in your sixties, close to retirement, you need to yeah. be in money market. Right. You, know, you need to be in mutual for stuff that's really safe. Right. And I think that's how it is. Like we were young, um, new, you know, newly married. We had mm -hmm. children, but they were younger, but um, we didn't have as much financial responsibility. So we could take some risks. Yeah. And for us, when we first jumped out into full-time entrepreneurship, it was because we couldn't afford to go to work. Like we kept mm -hmm. needing to uh, take vacation days to do our other business. Like that is we good. kept getting phone mm -hmm. calls and we couldn't be in two places at the same time. Right. And so one of the things I want to stress is that integrity piece. Like if you're working mm -hmm. for someone, you they are paying you to do a job. You can't That's be right. off leaving, you know, while you're getting paid mm -hmm. by somebody else to do your job or using right. company paper, making photocopies of your contracts and mm -hmm. using the company fax machine. You cannot do that. You have yes. to be a steward of that job because that job will, you won't have it for long. I'm you start, telling you. you, know, yes. you start using other people's money for your business. So yes. we, we, we have always been, you know, um, people of integrity when it comes to stuff like that. So we weren't, we weren't doing that, mm -hmm. but we were having to take off too much. It was like, uh Oh, we got to take off again. Cause we got to go yeah. sign this contract. Wow. We got to go do this house. So we had, we basically bought ourselves out of our job. It was like, we couldn't wow. afford to go to work yeah. because we were going to miss deals that would have paid us well over our salary. Wow. You know, you know, now we're in that middle age piece where it's like, you need, you need to be some aggressive and some not and so now we have a financial plan where we're like, mm -hmm. okay, now this is how much it costs to buy us out now. Because the buy us right. out then right. a little different right. to buy us out now. We have kids in college or we have yes. kids, things like that. So we have a number. We have numbers up on our wall. We just updated them, I think, last week or the week before. It was like, awesome. this is what we want in our savings account. This is what we want in our retirement. This is what we want in that. Ooh, so good. we look at it as really having multiple streams of income because people yes. will be like, Oh, it's a job. Well, first of all, thank God for that job. Yeah. Because yeah. you probably mm -hmm. have health insurance and hopefully retirement and yes. get into your social security and all that kind of stuff. So we right. don't look at it like, oh, we have to go to work and we have a business. We have multiple streams of income. Yes. That's one of our streams of income. We mm -hmm. do real estate. We have a t-shirt business. Whatever we wanted to do, we've had an escape room before. And right. you know, whatever we wanted to venture into, that's been another stream of income. That's and good. Probably about five or six years ago, I found myself doing things on my job that directly linked to one of our um, business ventures. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, so one of my girlfriends was like, you know, this is like free, like free on the job training. I think she called it. She right. was like, just think about it. Think about, you know, you're able to do this for your job. So yes. of course, make mental notes about what went well and what didn't go well. Mm -hmm. For me, we were doing a lot of facility related projects around our organization. And I was like, oh, so I met roofers, plumbers, foundation people. And guess who needed those this year? It was right. Five or six years later, but I was like, I know who to call. Wow. Because I've tried them out. I've done the bidding process on behalf of my mm -hmm. job. So, so looking at the like the silver lining in that, like thanking God for that job, being mm -hmm. very respons responsible and being great stewards of the job that God has mm -hmm. given you and realizing that you're learning, you're meeting people, and you just never know. There's, yes. I've worked, this is really funny. So I worked at Sprint, the Sprint mm -hmm. store on the plaza for like three days. <laughs> I was I was teaching and I was like, I'll get a summer job. Right. And I worked there for three days. I was like, I can't do this. So I worked with a guy for three days that I ended up having to call to, uh, about two months ago to help us with our insurance on, what? This, on this flip that we're doing. And, and my husband was like, how do you know him? I said, I worked with him for three days. Like, for three days. <laughs> It was like, y'all, it was like 15 years ago. Like, and so wow. I, just, I just connected with him on LinkedIn, like I do other people, and you just never know. So you wow. have to be good stewards, you have to treat people right, you mm. have to be fair. Because if I was over there messing up and coming in late and mistreating people, he would have said, I don't even want to be connected to you anymore. Right. So, you know, and, and uh, my mentor, when I Ooh. interned at Bayer Corporation, he's a a little older than me. He's a Jewish man. And he gives me all the tip, the tips from the Jewish community. Like right. and I worked for him when I was like 17 and 18 years old. So it's, it's like so cool to um, just know yeah. that when you've been the best steward of what God has given to you, he'll bring that resource right back out, right? When you need it. And you'll be Ooh. like, wow, that's why I was nice to you. Wow. <laughs> Ladies, it's time to check in with Lady E, September 24th at 7 p.m. Lady E will be speaking with Michelle Williams and Sharon D. Turner about the book, Checking In by Michelle Williams. For more information text questions to 816-7036-84. You said
see, beloved, more is at stake than just showing appreciation. This is one of those rare opportunities to present to God sacrificial honor that is scripturally triggered a divine intervention. How many of you need a divine intervention? How many of you need God to show up in a situation, whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, whether it's spiritually, whether it's financially, whether it's professionally? I'm tired of being stuck. I'm tired of feeling like I'm not progressing. What am I missing? Sacrifice, honor, words not used too much. Here is your invite to a live church for a new sermon series, Beyond Generosity That Reaches. Sunday, 10 a.m. on YouTube, The Alive Church KC. Ladies, it's time to check in with Lady E. September 24th at 7 p.m., Lady E. will be speaking with Michelle Williams and Sharon D. Turner about the book, Checking In by Michelle Williams. For more information text questions to 816670 What are you waiting for? Come to WillParkerJr.com. Grab your t-shirt. Grab your hoodie. You can even grab some music. Come on! You have been cordially invited to celebrate the completion of the first year of ministry of a live church. With guest speaker, Apostle Ivy Hilliard. Join us as we celebrate all that God has done, and as we look to the future, for greater. To God be the glory. We, go, we went to Malachi 3, uh, 8 through 10. We talked about how he said, bring the tithe to the store, how that there may meet, be meat in my house. Leviticus 27, 3 says this, and all the tithe, and all the tithe, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Here's the thing you got to understand. When you bring your tithe and offering, it is a holy encounter. Yeah. It is an intimate encounter where Jesus, and we're going to hit this before we finish, where Jesus receives your offering and your tithes and offering and takes it and worships to the Father. Mm -hmm. And so it is an intimate encounter it is not something that you just try to hurry up and get past in a service it is literally an intimate encounter it is a holy encounter between you and the god of the universe yeah. and so we have to understand that the tithe belongs to god and so the first thing what makes a person disobey god number one they get food into thinking they can do what other people do without any consequences Oh my goodness. It, it, it is amazing how they, they, they get fooled into thinking that they can do what other people do without any consequence. And we're going to all see this in Adam because we're going to go back to Genesis in the garden. I just believe that if something is not based in Genesis, the first seven chapters, it is not valid. And you can see everything. Every principle is demonstrated in Genesis, especially the first seven chapters. Watch this. It says, uh, Genesis uh, uh, 3 and 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. 
And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the first voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And so watch this. Here's the thing. Remember Leviticus 27 said the tithe belongs to God. And remember the commandment that God told them not to touch this particular tree. Don't even eat the fruit of it. Don't touch it. Don't eat the fruit of it. Well, that was something that literally belonged to God. They wasn't supposed to touch it. Just like we're not supposed to touch the tithe. We're supposed to bring the tithe to God because it belongs to them. Remember our first one is people are food into thinking they can do what other people people do without any consequences why where do we see that remember eve ate the fruit first and nothing happened <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. eve ate the fruit first and nothing happened when eve ate the fruit nothing happened but everything changed when adam ate it because of what he heard because because god spoke the word to adam Adam, Amen. he had a higher standard. And what we have to understand as believers, since we have the word, God holds us to a higher yes, standard than, than the world does. Yes, and so what the world does, they can get away with. It seems like they're getting away. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But 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 we can't get away because God holds us to a certain standard. And here's the key we have to understand. Because God loves us and he has to be true. He got to he got to do what he says he's going to do whether negative or positive. He hold has to hold us accountable because of what he heard. Then you cannot get away with what others do no matter what the situation is. So because God holds Holds us a higher standard. We see this Romans 5 and 5 12 says this when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. Sin entered human experience, and death was the result. And so death followed this sin, casting its shadow over all humanity because all have sinned. Uh, King James puts it like this: He says, Through one man, yeah. sin entered the world. But Eve ate it first. Oh my goodness. It's because he got the word. Mm -hmm. He passed the word on to his wife. And so he was held to a high standard. Think about this. Think about this. In, in Ezekiel, the Bible, the, the God tells the prophet, he says, if you, you don't tell them what I tell you to tell them and they die in their sin, their blood is on your hand. Oh my goodness. God has a higher expectation for the prophet, for the for the leader, for the pastor than he even do do for the people. It's just a part of how it goes. And so God has a higher standard for his children than even for the children of the world because the truth of the matter is, people can be the devil can bless people. Yeah. But watch this, he's doing it in a tricky way because he's trying to set them up to ultimately die. So our first thing is people are fooled into thinking they can get away. And so we see this in Adam. Adam, Adam thought he was getting away. He said nothing happened when Eve did it. But when Adam ate it, oh, everything broke loose. Everything broke loose. And so that moves us to our Savior. What makes a person disobey God? People do not believe that curse or consequences are real because they see other people seemingly yeah. prospering without giving. Oh my goodness. These, these are people who, who are looking at unsaved mm -hmm. people and saying, oh my goodness, they, they're doing very well and they ain't giving. <laughs> these people are, are smoking and drinking and doing all type of stuff and they seem they driving nice cars they got nice houses they got million dollar contracts but watch this there's a difference between a condition of being cursed and being in a position of being being cursed the condition is the manifestation of not tithing it is the ultimate result the position is you deciding not to Oh, oh my goodness. Hey, remember when I used the water bottle, the, uh, the soda bottle? It's about position. What happens is the, the, the bottle has a top on it. When you decide to not tithe, you put the top on it. 
Oh my goodness. But eventually you will be in a condition where the bottle is turned upside down with the top on it. So not only uh, is it capped off where nothing can get in, but now it's out of position. And so how do you get in position? You first repent and confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you get put in position. Then you begin to demonstrate and show and start t giving your tithe and offer and then the cap is taken off and then you can be filled. Oh yeah. my goodness. And so watch this. The position is first. You cannot believe that because you have material possessions, you are blessed. Being blessed is more than having material That's possessions right. because people have big houses but can't have peace. That's right. People have a lot of money but yet commit suicide. And so you can have all the material wealth and not be able to enjoy them. And so we as believers, the reason why we have to be taught on giving is because then we can receive the material wealth and have the capacity to believe and, and, and to and to enjoy them yeah. and not allow the material possessions to control us but yes. we control it yeah. and so when God comes and tell us to give some of our wealth away to tithe we're not concerned why because it, we don't have a love for money That's right. <laughs> remember the scripture says for the love of money is the root of all evil I know some of you are used to hearing for the love, for money is the root. It doesn't say for money is the root. It says for the love of money. Right. And when you love your money so much that you're not willing to tithe, when you love your money so much that you're not willing to give offerings, when you love your money or your stuff so much that if God tells you to give it away, you're not willing to, mm -hmm. then you need to take a step back and take a reality check. You can have possessions, but you but that don't mean you can enjoy them. Okay. You can have you can never confuse material prosperity or material success with fulfillment of life mm -hmm. and that the curse is not in effect in your life. Think about this. God told Adam that the day you when you eat this fruit, you're gonna die. Adam sees his wife eat the fruit, nothing happens. He eats the fruit. And all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my goodness. Adam's in the garden. Now they notice they naked. Now they hear the voice of God walking in the cool of day. They hide themselves. They weren't concerned about everything. To, he didn't die, but his position changed. Oh my goodness. He didn't die, but now he wasn't comfortable in being who he was prior to. Now he didn't die, but now when he hear the voice of God walking in the cool of day, he's hiding himself instead of running to him. This was the same man that God walked with and God talked with and God told him to name the animals and he was bold enough to name the animals. He had an intimate relationship and now he's hiding hiding from the very one he was intimate with. Why? Because he disobeyed him. Oh my goodness. What's another reason uh, what makes people disobey God? There is a voice that is louder or takes priority over God's voice. Mm. There is a voice in their life that is louder or takes priority over God's voice. Mm -mm 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 -mm. This this is so key. And we see this in, in Adam too. Genesis 3, 17. And to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All of your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Oh my goodness. He said, because you put your wife's voice or you made your wife's voice louder than my voice because you obeyed her and instead of trusting and obeying me because you put your wife first. This is the reason why you're in the position that you're in. Mm. Let me ask you this. What voices have you made louder than God's? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. What voices mm -hmm. have you made louder than God's? What voices before today have you put me? Has it been your children? 
Instead of giving your tithe, you're going and buying stuff uh, for your children. Instead of obeying God and trusting God to take care of all your needs, you're you're, you're trusting, you're giving to a, to a, to a woman. You, instead of, instead of you uh, 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 being in worship on a consistent basis because you're so uh, 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 happy with the things that you have, you now got to go wash your car when you should be. A, you now are going uh, to to the to the uh, other places because you now have the money to because you're putting all these what voices are you allowing the world to tell you you don't need that bible is outdated antiquated and outdated so why are you listening to it why are you hearing that they just want your money they don't care about you are you allowing the devil to get in your ear and now you've allowed him to move you off of what you used to believe wow what voice are you listening to mama? Does mama got more authority in your life than God does? Does daddy got more authority? Do your spouse got more authority than God does? Just, just, just something to think about. Because when, when you allow a voice to be louder than God, you affect everyone around you. Think about it. when When Adam messed up, it didn't just affect him. It affected Eve. It affected his children. And affected everybody else that would come after him. When you disobey God, not only you are impacted, but everyone around you is impacted. If you go to Joshua chapter 7, uh, you see the children of Israel. And the children of Israel had just came off a great battle. You remember the story of Jericho where they walked around the walls uh, uh, seven, seven, once Every day uh, for six days and on the seventh day, walk around seven times and they shouted, blew the trumpets and shouted and the walls came down. They went up and took all the spoils and conquered the land. Well, this same Israel, they're now going against a, 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 a small a country named Ai. They don't even send all the soldiers. They go and think they're about to win this battle and get their butts whipped. They come back. Joshua goes before God. God, what's going on? We shouldn't lose to this these people. And God says, you got sin in the camp. He says, go, go tribe by tribe. And he, he finally got to Achan. <laughs> and they found out that Achan, because God told them this first battle of Jericho, all the stuff belongs to me. And they were supposed to give it to God. It belonged to God. And Achan took and hid some of the stuff in his house. Oh, my goodness. And, and they found the stuff hidden in his house. And not only did they kill Achan, but they killed his whole family. So not only with Achan's sin, disobeying, touching what belonged to God, oh my good, touching what belonged to God, not giving God his portion, not trusting God to take care of his needs, but being selfish and being greedy and taking what belonged. Not only did he lose his life, not only did his family lose his life, but when they went to battle the people at AI, they lost that battle and men died in that. And so what he did impacted everybody around him. And because the Bible is true, Galatians 6 and 7 says this, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For that whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It, it, the the uh, central, the uh, contemporary English says this, You cannot fool God, mm -hmm. so don't make a fool of yourself. You will harvest what you plant. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. You need to be very, very careful of what seeds you're placing. There, oh my, oh, oh, go get it in a bus. So shake it in a. There are some parents. There are some parents who, who, who don't have a relationship with God. There are some parents who don't have a relationship with God. And you need to be very, very careful because the Bible says, uh, do not be mocked. Whatever you sow, whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Why you got to be careful? Because you are presenting a certain image before your children. Oh, my goodness. You are living a life before your children that I don't care how much you think you're covering up. Your children see how you're living. Why? You're sowing seeds of unbelief in God. And there's going to come a point in time where you give your life to Jesus. And then you're going to want your children to be saved. But then you're going to have to deal with the life you lived before them. Oh my goodness. There are some people who are getting in debt and more and more in debt and you're not trusting God with your finances and you're sowing seeds 
of unbelief. You're sowing seeds of corruption. You're sowing seeds that God is not invited in your finances. And so you're going to get in a bond in a situation where then you want God to show up. And God is not going to be there because you haven't invited him up into that particular. You didn't trust yeah. him with the tithe. You didn't trust him with the heart. And you're struggling with debt. And you're struggling with your kids' yeah. rebellion. And you're struggling. And you're saying, oh God, I I can't handle this cross and God is hollering from heaven this is not Amen. your cross this is your crop Ooh. oh my goodness oh my oh my. Yes. When, when, when apostle here said that this is not your cross it is your crop. It is what you've been sowing. It is what you have been putting into the ground. But I have good news for you that even though you may have sown in the past, today can be your day where you change. Oh my yes. goodness. Today can be the day that you begin to sow different seed. Yeah. Today can be the day that you start planting seeds yeah. into your spouse. Today can be the day that you start planting words of encouragement into your spouse. Yeah. Today could be the day that you start speaking good things into yes. your children. Today could be the good day that you start living a life for Jesus before your spouse and your children that can begin to change your present and your future. What you plant today is a conversation with your future. Oh my goodness. Amen. Mm. Oh my, yeah. God just said, many of you don't understand that you're a prophet and don't even know it. Mm. Oh, what is a prophet? A prophet is able to speak, to see the speak what he sees in the future. What you do is, what you speak today is your future. Oh my goodness. And when you speak, it shall come to pass. And so you've been speaking negativity. You've been speaking doom. Yes. Oh, you've goodness. been speaking you're stupid. You've been speaking oh, you're not goodness. smart. Yeah. You've been speaking you're ugly. And it's been manifesting for you because you have what you say. Come on. Oh my yes. goodness. Either oh, in Lord. the positive or the negative. And so I've come to tell you that yeah. you can either keep speaking what your flesh desires you can keep speaking yes. whatever the world is telling you you can keep speaking Hallelujah. the standards of the devil or you can begin to speak the standards of the spirit of the God by the word of God you can get into that word and say God loves me God cares for me he's demonstrated his love because he gave me Jesus and so the Holy Spirit is pouring it out according to Romans 5 and 5 and so today right now I receive God's love and I'm going to Speak, and I'm going to start speaking different to my spouse. Oh my, oh my goodness. Some of you married people need to repent right now because you've been speaking so negatively to your spouse. You've been uh, causing hell in your house and you wonder why hell is yes. still there. It's not your spouse. <laughs> oh my Ooh. goodness. It's not your, the spirit Lord says yes. it is you husband it is you wife because you have sown uh, uh, uh oh my goodness oh my goodness you have yeah. sown negativity you have sown discouragement you have sown neither one of you wanting to be home and so today you need to change it yeah. you need to not only repent to god but you need to repent to one another the bible i, I believe is first peter three and seven. It talks about that when a man is not in good relationship with his wife, God don't even hear his prayers. His prayers are hindered. And I believe that not only goes to the husband, but that goes to the wife Amen. as well. And so if you're not treating your spouse with love and affection, God ain't even trying to hear you. No. The Bible says, how can you love me whom you never seen, but not love your brother whom you see daily? Can I switch that up? And I believe it fits. How can you say you love Love God whom you never seen and yet hate your spouse whom you chose. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And so today could be the day, whether it's through your relationships or whether it's through not inviting God into your finances. How do you invite God into your finances? You begin to love him enough to trust him with it. You begin to love him enough to follow his system. And the system that God has placed is tithe and offerings. Can I be 100% with you? 
I'm going to keep it 100 with you. The, God set this system up. It's not the preacher who set it up. He's just going following God's script. God's script for the church to prosper is for him to prosper the people, the people to prosper to such a degree that they bring their tithes into the storehouse, Malachi 3, that there may be meat 